Really, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much to the organising committee for the opportunity to talk to you about Grand Challenge 1 today. This is the first of the Grand Challenges, and in particular, it has a focus on understanding both the state of marine ecosystems, but also their variability. Um, this is another sim simple schematic which doesn't have the same icons, but obviously each of the three grand challenges linked together. And while Eddie in his keynote this morning pushed us quite a long way to understanding the human parts of the system, Grand Challenge 1 does have a very strong focus in understanding the biophysical aspects of the ocean. I'll remind you again about how IMBA science has developed. And just like the IPCC doesn't necessarily pay a whole bunch of scientists to produce work around climate change, IMBA doesn't directly fund a lot of us to do our work. And so we're informed by things like the science implementation plan, which suggests these grand challenges and implementation challenges. And as a result of that, activities like the Imbizo summer schools, these conferences we're at now and various regional programs then attempt to deliver on, on those grand challenges and innovation challenges. Outside of that is a wider community of people who are um, indirectly involved with IMBA, maybe they only come to a conference every few years or so, um, maybe they're just co-publishing with people who are in working groups, but that's a wider set of the family of IMBA that is also contributing to understanding these grand challenges. And we also hope very much to influence the extreme wider community. And maybe these are people who are out here who can't remember what IMBA stands for or what the particular grand challenges were, but their research is also really important in helping in perhaps providing synthesis, for example, that helps IMBA itself draw together how it's addressing the grand challenges. So depending on where you stand under that spotlight, you know, all of the research that's being presented this week will be contributing to IMBA in trying to help improve and deliver on its science goals. That grand challenge one then is composed of two parts, to develop whole of system understanding of ecosystems, including from the biogeochemical all the way through to the upper parts of the food chain and even the humans who um, harvest from the ocean as well. It's really important to get a good sense of the spatial and temporal scales at which those processes operate. And we want to be able to do that so that we can understand how that system might change into the future. And that's how it will change under both natural and anthropogenic influences on the ocean, of which climate change is one of the most pressing ones that I'll illustrate in the remainder of the presentation. The grand challenge then is broken down into two more parts then. And the first one I just mentioned was understanding the natural um, climate change, and the, sorry, natural cycles of climate change and variability, and then also the anthropogenic contribution, which we see in a whole range of ways that the ocean is changing. And in particular, it becomes very challenging in a non-equilibrium world, one that's under rapid change now, to actually understand how those interactions vary across space and time. And I'll illustrate again what the challenge that means of, of how if, 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 the, if the trend is changing, how you're going to unpack those competing processes of natural and um, anthropogenic variation on the ocean. Here are four of the regional programs, for example, that have a very strong focus and understanding for Grand Challenge 1, linkages between food webs and biogeochemical cycles. And in particular, the Indian Ocean program, the ICE and the Antarctic program, and also Cleartop, which is a global program looking at top order predators, have all having a, having a crack at addressing Grand Challenge number one. And I'm going to give some examples of that. But as, as we go through this work, just bear in mind and have a think about, you know, who cares about the state of the ocean at the moment? We hope that things like the sustainable development goals or national reporting systems or so on are interested in using our research. But ultimately, even those programs are, are producing those summaries because we want to make things better for society. And I echo that same point as Eddie. It will be very unsatisfying for us in our careers if we've helped publish another paper or thrown another bit of information at policymakers, but it hasn't had any real practical outcome. I'm you know, really excited with the direction that IMBA has taken over the past um, five or so years in really emphasising the importance of linking to the social and um, uh, governance sciences as well. So have a look, think as we go through the week also, what are kind of products that you can produce that will really make that translation from the primary science through to the end user much easier? You know, what kind of things does do society demand from us as scientists and how can we better, better deliver to them? So I'll give an example of where we've um, progressed with that Grand Challenge 1, with a sustained period package of work that's spanned more than 15 years or so. And it's been undertaken in the Clear Top Regional Program, which looks at the um, impacts on top ocean predators. Top ocean predators include the tuna and the billfish, but also other things at the top of the food chain, um, like seabirds um, and marine mammals. 
And the goal of ClearTOP is trying to develop a predictive capability that can then be implemented in um, ecosystem models, for example, and used to underpin management decisions around the ocean. So the example I'll go through steps through each one of those steps from the very basic understanding of the biogeochemical patterns all the way through to how, how we can now deliver that information to modelers, for example. One of the early things that ClearTOP did was it assembled data that had been collected by disparate programs over a wide area of the ocean. And these were groups that had been collecting um, muscle samples for their own analyses, but hadn't ever contributed them together into a common program. And one of the really great efforts led by two of the pioneers in ClearTOP, jo Jock Young and Bob Olson, was to get people to contribute those samples into a common database. And then they've been analysing that in a whole range of ways. And it's now up to more than 4,000 samples across three major tuna species, albacore, yellowfin and big eye. And as a result of those tissue samples, the group was able to use the isotope concentrations in the tissues to work out the trophic level of the fish in different parts of the ocean. And these GAM pot plots illustrate for the three tuna species going in rows from yellowfin, big eye and albacore, how they responded in terms of their trophic position on the y-axis, that's how high they are in the food chain, to three different variables. And just pay attention to oxygen in the middle. And that says that depending on which species you are, you respond differently to the level of oxygen in the ocean in terms of, of your trophic position. It might be easy to think about in terms of in areas where there's very little oxygen, food chains can be very short, and so tuna tend to eat quite low in the food chain, and so their trophic position is quite low. In areas where there's a lot of oxygen, maybe the food chain is a little bit longer, and so tuna eat at the top of a longer food chain, and so they have slightly higher trophic position. But each one of those species has a different relationship with oxygen and with a whole bunch of other environmental variables. And they also have different relationships depending on where you are in the ocean. And so this analysis here again shows for the three species, yellowfin, big eye and albacore, and each of those dots represents a different environmental variable that influences the trophic position that the tuna occupy. And you can see circles on top of each one of those groups of um, columns of data, and that indicates that oxygen is really important for all of the species, but its relative importance varies. And the other thing that this um, analysis also showed us that you could not make a global tuna model that would predict the trophic position of tuna everywhere in the world. And we're trying to do that in a lot of cases. We're trying to make global models. And yet the explanatory power, if you use those variables at a global scale, as is in the left-hand um, column of each of those three plots, the explanatory power of trying to make a global model was much lower than if you tried to make regional models. So we need to encourage people who are making global models of tuna to be able to condition the parameters regionally. And that's a much more complicated thing than putting a single relationship into your ocean model. The group then was able to um, produce plots that showed you what the trophic position of these three different tuna was in different parts of the ocean. And in areas where it's blue, the animals are occupying a fairly low trophic level position, and where it's green, they're, uh, green or yellow, they're occupying a higher trophic position. So again, this work illustrates that we've gone all the way from collecting samples to understanding the environmental relationship for working out the scale and resolution of the right models to then interpret that data and finally produce the spatial plots then that could help us understand how, the, how modifications to that environment might affect food webs. So it really illustrates that first grand challenge going all the way from the biogeochemical understanding of how isotopes are incorporated in tuna, tuna flesh all the way through to explaining you know, how you might have productivity differences in different parts of the ocean. Another example of understanding ocean state comes from the CYBER program, the Sustained Indian Ocean Biogeochemical and Ecosystem Research Program, and that's focused on understanding cycling in the Indian Ocean. And they've made a really big effort to support an initiative that celebrates the 50th year of a major research exploration effort in the Indian Ocean. And they're going back and resampling places to see what's changed over 50 years in the Indian Ocean. And one of those cruises just finished last week, and it sampled what's known as the 110 degree line, which runs north, south of Western Australia. And going back and sampling 50 years later, look at things like how um, alkalinity ratios have changed in the ocean, what's happening to oxygen profiles, as well as the obvious things like how have the phytoplankton and zooplankton communities changed. And you won't be surprised to think that, well, they're going to come back and say the ocean's changed over that 50 year period. And that change is going to be no surprise to any of us when we again remember how rapidly the ocean is changing. And this example is of the Keeling curve, which I downloaded this morning, and we're currently tracking at about 414 parts per million in terms of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. 
Um, the blue arrow there is when I first became involved with Cleartop and the predecessor to IMBA in about the year 2000 or so. So in my period of time with being associated with this community, we've added you know, about 44 parts per million of, of carbon dioxide. And I hate to think what it's going to do over the next 20 years I've got left. Um, I always find this a very sobering thought to remind us how fast the ocean is changing. And if it's changing that rapidly, what good do baseline studies do anymore? As soon as you've completed a baseline study, the world may have shifted and moved on. And so then you'll need to do another baseline study so that you understand the system again. So as a scientific community, we've got to decide how do we do our studies when the ocean is changing so rapidly that a baseline is kind of not really very meaningful anymore. Um, one explanation, one um, perhaps hope is that the ocean will return to a more um, natural state once we get greenhouse gases under control. But again, I'm not very optimistic around that. And in this example here, I use this to remind stakeholders I work with about we're not going back to a pre-industrial CO2 world. This is data that comes from the Vostok ice core. When you take a deep drill through that portion of the Antarctic ice cap, from the bubbles in the ice, you can work out the carbon dioxide ratio and the, sorry, carbon dioxide level from the ratio of carbon isotopes in the ice core, and also the temperature. And the plot on the right-hand side shows where the climate system has oscillated for the last 800,000 years, in and out of glacial and interglacial periods. And that's been our climate system up until the pre-industrial period of around 1850 or so. And we're sitting up in that green arrow now with around this 414 parts per million of CO2. A colleague I heard talk last week described it as a Milankovitch cycle of human impact on the planet. Remember, Milankovitch cycles are how the planet rotates around the sun. We've impacted the planet to such a degree, it, in effect, it's changed the orbit of the Earth around the sun in terms of what it's done to our climate. I think we're unlikely to see that shift back, even if countries do all their great greenhouse gas emissions work. So it's going to be a critical decade for the ocean. It's this period of really rapid change. And it's so rapid that some of our colleagues are starting to think about the interventions we're going to need. Things like solar radiation management, upwelling from deep in the ocean. Um, ocean fertilisation has still got some advocates out there who think that might be an option. And so, in some sense, our community is trying to understand and provide advice into even those kind of decision making now. You know, what modifications to the ocean might our science be called on to either permit or rebut? So, if it's a critical decade, we need to do things pretty fast. Time's critical. And so the kind of collaboration example I showed you with the work led by Heidi Pethelbridge and her colleagues with, with assembling all of that data that existed from around the ocean, we need more and more of those efforts. And the IMBA family is one way of, of providing an umbrella for that. We're going to need lots of breakthroughs with using smarter technology in the ocean. And so examples are now automated vehicles, drones, um, and so on that are collecting information on subsurface properties. We've, riv we've ridden pretty well on, ocean, on, sorry, on satellite products that give us a synoptic view of the ocean, but I think increasingly we need to know what's going on subsurface, because that's where the heat in the ocean is being stored. And finally, as uh, Kelly suggested in, in introducing me, I've really been very interested in the kind of the interventions and adaptation options that we can offer. Um, and I think we need options like adaptation and maybe even some geoengineering things if we're to maintain some kind of system state. But increasingly in this decade, it will be very important that we, we look and help with deciding in options that won't really mess things up. And for example, a lot of geoengineering options, like putting solar radiation uh, shades into space, they won't help the ocean very much because they don't reduce carbon dioxide uptake by the ocean. So ocean acidification will go on while the planet attempts some kind of cooling strategies. I think you're, we're going to start to see these things be piloted over the next decade. It's also apparent from Grand Challenge, that, number one, that the second part is getting a really clear understanding of the range of time and space scales over which these processes operate. So I gave again the example of the trophic level position of tuna, which showed how variable that was around the different oceans. Um, even things like warming are not affecting the ocean equally. And in this analysis, it just identifies some 20 odd places in the ocean where the temperature is warming really rapidly. And these are hot spots where the impacts of climate change are being fe felt first. And so studying what's going on in those particular areas can be a chance to look at what might happen in some of the slower warming areas in the future. So exploit variability in the ocean is one way of, of understanding this time and space scales better. The other way that variability is kind of playing into us is shrinking the amount of time that we have to understand the ocean. And if you were an optimist, you might believe that the planet will be held to 1.5 degrees of warming. 
If you're not particularly optimistic, you'll recognise we might hit somewhere around that target. And if you're a realist, you'll probably realise we're going to hit one and a half degrees of warming as a global average, perhaps around the middle of this century. And so that's really shortened the time period that we have to understand what's going on in the ocean. The other point is that interannual variability and extremes also shorten that amount of time until we have critical damage or critical change. And so those wiggles in variability also shorten that period of time before we're going to ex experience a condition like one and a half degrees, for example. So we've got a really short window, and that's how I can say to you, you know, the next 10 years is a really critical decade for understanding ocean processes and deciding how we're going to respond to them. And that variability really matters to all ecosystems. And I give now an example from the ESAS program, which is about looking at Arctic and subarctic seas. And the work that scientists there have been involved with and, collabor and contributing to has looked at how bottom temperature in the Bering Sea varies over time. And even just comparing the 2017 and 2018 year, there are very dramatic differences that emerge very, very quickly in this system. And they lead to things like a, a slightly warmer ocean, which allows Pacific species, the, um, cod and halibut and um, pollock, to move into different parts of that ocean region. Now, people are going to follow those fish and chase them, and so that now brings with it different perhaps social or economic um, challenges for communities that are now exposed to either new harvesting or have lost their old harvesting opportunities. So again, the Antarctic story would have been just the same as this one that the Bering Sea is experiencing. And the most extreme level of variability are actually the extremes themselves. And I think while we um, have had a tradition of studying variability in the ocean, a study of extremes can, can lead to even greater insight in even more rapid um, and shorter periods of time. So I'm going to give some examples of using marine heat waves as examples of variability. But the other things that we study here are extreme processes like cyclones and hurricanes and the effect they have on nutrient cycling or the storage of carbon in the ocean, storm surges that influence coastal erosion and human settlements, tsunamis that do an even better job of impacting coastal communities and settlements, deoxygenation zones that are a result of eutrophication, for example, and even things like upwelling that can lead to um, low pH waters coming to the surface and impacting on aquaculture operations, as has happened on the west coast of the United States. So we've got all these extremes going on in the ocean as well, and I think they offer a very um, great window both for understanding process and for communicating to stakeholders about the urgency of the situation. Um, Marine heat waves are something that's been getting a bit more press over the last couple of years, and they're periods where the ocean is ex experiencing really anomalously hot temperatures. The, probably the one that I first became aware of was in the Mediterranean in the year 2003, and that one was synchronous with a really tremendous atmospheric heat wave that did um, yeah, great harm to um, France and, and Russia as well, with many tens of thousands of people dying at that period of time. There have been other oceanic events that have just been ocean only in origin, um, in the northwest Atlantic, in the northeast Pacific and off Western Australia have all been high profile marine heat wave events that have given us a window of that shortened time period of what the end of the century might look like if we saw dramatic warming. And trends in, uh, sorry, marine heat waves are also increasing in frequency. And so the trend is that at the moment we're experiencing somewhere around 70 days of the year in the global ocean could be classified as marine heat waves. Our work on projections shows that by the end of the century, every day in the ocean will be classified as a marine heat wave. So we're going to see really, really dramatic signals. And again, this illustrates to the community and stakeholders in large that climate change is not coming tomorrow. It's already here. And so now in the year 2018, we've experienced 34% increase in heat wave frequency. They're 17% longer. And the amount of time that the, that the ocean is experiencing marine heat waves is also 54% over a 1900 period of time. So really dramatic changes in these extremes. And extremes then play a really valuable role in communicating urgency. And, you know, in some sense, disaster brings opportunity. And it brings opportunity because people pay attention to it. So in 2015-16, in we had a very large marine heat wave off the east coast of Tasmania, and it lasted for almost 250 days. And that caused a tremendous amount of stress for aquaculture operators. It led to declines in catch of commercial seafood species and has impacted reproduction in subsequent years as well. And what we noticed as we tried to describe this event to reporters is that we really lacked a language to do that. We were describing things like, well, it's a sustained warming of uh, 1.5 degrees in terms of cumulative temperature over the pre-industrial period. Um, I think we used a normalised climatology. And nobody wrote that down. <laughs> 
we began to think about just as in cyclones have category one, two, three cyclones, maybe if we classified events as category one, two, three, we could ride on the back of the cyclone communication activity. And so that, that's been an approach we're trying with communicating to the public about these category one, two, three, four or so on events as things that are really impacting the ocean now. And so that part of communication is important that we all pay attention to. We've got to sell our science in some way to those who need to know it. Um, extreme events are also very useful in a negative way because they show very clearly again what impacts will be. And these two graphs here just show, for example, for coral reefs on the top and for seagrass on the, on the bottom graph there, that the more days that you have of heat wave in a region, the greater mortality you have in either corals or the decline in the number of shoot, uh, sorry, in shoot density for seagrass on the y-axis for the lower plot. So again, really dramatic impacts on ecosystems people care about. If this had been a phytoplankton graph, I don't think the world at large um, would have cared quite so much as they do about corals and seagrass. And so we try and choose those examples to have maximum impact with stakeholders too. So we know that extremes are out there and they're at the tail end of that variability that, that I talked about. So how can this aid our prediction? If we get good process understanding as this grand challenge suggests we should, we should be able to then do a better job of prediction. When prediction's hard, you can at least provide up-to-date information. And so this is a website that was released a couple of weeks ago by my colleague Rob Schlegel, who's here today, and I'm gonna meet face-to-face -face for the first time. But he's produced a website that means that at any place in the world, you can understand the time history of an extreme event for your region. This, one, this shows us what's going on in the ocean now and shows us where heat waves are going on at the moment. And if you click on any one of those pixels, you get the time history of heat waves for that event. So now biologists, so for example, can recreate a history of extreme events for any place in the ocean that they care about. So that's a heat wave example. What else could our community be doing for other kind of extremes? Could I get this for upwelling events? Could I get it for pH um, outbreaks, for, uh, sorry, p uh, upwelling outbreaks that lead to pH changes? What about deoxygenation events? How can we give the decision makers, for example, this kind of information at their fingertips? And even if I can't do a prediction, at least describing the real-time pattern is one step towards better decision making. So I think we really can use knowledge to help society. Um, and that grand challenge is really about how do we help, you know, given what we know about time and space scales, how do we help society do things? And so even as we try and get models going that can do the real forecasting thing, we can do a really god good job with statistical projection. And statistical projection is even, you know, if that's too hard, we can do it with our expert knowledge. And I know that scientists have got more confident with the kinds of things Eddie talked about, which was, you know, putting your opinion out there and deciding where you stand on particular issues. But we can use that expertise to make, to make predictions. And so, for example, with heat waves, I could be saying, well, under condition X, we predict um, outcome number Y. And the early career researcher group yesterday that had a workshop, I, I'm pretty sure would have gone through this um, infographic that Chris Satanovich developed, which was about achieving policy impact. It's a really valuable way of just thinking about how do I achieve impact with my science? And do, doing the good engagement and having things like heat waves or iconic species or being able to do prediction is a really useful way of having, of having that impact. So for example, with heat waves, if I understand what are the range of oceanographic processes that influence heat waves, and in this schematic here, it's a Stommel diagram with the space-time um, scales of variability, heat waves fit, sit somewhere in the middle, so they should be influenced by these kind of processes like El Nino and IDIOD and Pacific Decadal Oscillation, for example. And so then, if we mapped what's our relationship with heat waves with some of these large-scale climate drivers, we should be able to do prediction. So in the top left, for example, is the relationship of heat waves, those extreme events that cause coral bleaching and lead to death of seagrass, with a climate driver like the Nino um, expression of, of ENSO. And so everywhere it's red, when we have an El Nino, we expect more marine heat waves. So now if you tell me an El Nino is coming, you should then be able to make a, a marine heat wave prediction. In the cases where it's blue, that says if we have an El Nino, we expect less marine heat waves. So we can use our knowledge about systems to try and prepare people for, for example, extreme events arriving. So the future is going to be very different under all of these, this rapid change as illustrated by the carbon dioxide curve for the way the heating's happening in the ocean. And so that means, again, under the grand challenges, we try and understand what's going in, on in the ocean, we're actually going to get, perhaps we won't get any better at it because the ocean's constantly changing. And that means that all of the experience that you gather may actually become less useful in the future. 
you know, being an expert in something 20 years old is no good anymore at all. And so it's really important that we learn as fast as we can. And we can learn as fast as we can by exploiting variability and extremes because they're the window into what the future might bring. And so you can get ahead of the long-term change in the ocean by looking at those extremes and, and the variability. And we really want to help people make decisions that will help them cope with changes as well. And that's going to mean the best we can. You've got to think about providing advice that can be used in risk-based senses. It's likely that we will see a marine heat wave this year. How would that influence your aquaculture operation? Well, I might decide I'm going to harvest my fish early, I'm going to change my stocking density, I'm going to feed them on a food that will let them cope with warm temperatures, I'm going to do their disease treatment, I'm going to have to clean my cages more often. I could go on and on with the kind of examples that we can provide to operators if we know a particular set of environmental conditions are coming. So we've got to use that knowledge. Typically, we have three ways that we try and learn about the ocean. and We've got to learn them all, we've got to use them all faster. We use observations, but replications limited. We use experiments, but scale's limited. We can use models, but usually the mechanism is limited. And so by having a good balance between that uh, use of observations, experiments, and models, I think we can get the, get the insight we need to be able to provide advice in a very rapidly changing world. I think we're going to see a real revolution in the next 10 years in the expanding use of models. Through time, models have got better and faster. And so they've gone from things like simple food web models, which just depicted the biophysical portion of the environment, through to models that contained something about the management system that exploited that biological environment. So fisheries has had a very long history of putting harvesting into models, for example, so you could look at the effect of removing fish on the number of fish that were left in the ocean. In the last five or so years, many model developers have also been including other aspects of the economy. And again, these are the things like the um, effect of infrastructure in the ocean, how society might value different parts that will have a feedback on the management processes that exploit the ocean, ocean resources, and things like climate impacts are going in, the number of industries that are being represented in models is increasing dramatically. And I'm sure that Eric will show you um, some more examples of this in either his or Laurent Bopp's presentation on, on Grand Challenge number two. So models are now getting a much, much better job of really representing the ocean. And we have a wide range that can be used. And so the idea anymore that one model will provide the answer is no longer going to be sufficient either. We're seeing people put together programs that use multiple models to ask the same question. And you get greater insight into the processes by having multiple models answer the same question. And again, the um, fish modelling team had a really great example of that released in a publication last week or the week before, which demonstrated ensemble averages of what multiple models were telling us about change in, in trophic structure in the ocean. Really exciting to kind of, you know, helps me scratch the physics envy of having mo multiple biological models being used to solve problems. I'll wrap up by saying, you know, our future efforts as an IMBA community and as an ocean science community have got to do four, four things much better. Um, and I count them, I've got five things much better. Um, first of those is we've got to incorporate all of those other processes into our ocean models. Models have to have climate change in them now. The pace of change is so great that I don't think a model that doesn't represent climate change can do a good job. Um, once we get those results, we've got to do a really good job of translating them to our industry and stakeholder partners and doing them, letting them use models that are imperfect because they need to learn how to handle information as well. I think while models are one aspect, we're also going to see increased use of gliders, subsurface technologies that help us understand ocean state and perhaps we'll even have better biological samplers as well that can sense the DNA in the water and then reconstruct food webs on the basis of who's in the ocean from their, their DNA signal. I already emphasised the multiple modelling approaches and the advantage of using that. Um, and really I hope that that you know, greater awareness with communicating with stakeholders will help us do the blue economy in a positive fashion. And uh, you know, I had had a pretty myopic view after, um, until I heard Eddie talk before this about what a positive benefit the blue economy was going to be. Um, but how do we help make sure that the benefits are realised of that blue economy? And in Australia, we've got examples of where people are um, pretty opposed to some sorts of marine development. And I had not really understood it, but Eddie's suggestion this morning made me think maybe it is about the inequity. And if you can't see a development like offshore aquaculture really helping you in the ocean, um, maybe it is a, a something that you reject. So that idea of getting together social scientists very early in these processes is a, a really strong message that Eddie, Eddie reinforced this morning. If we don't do that job well, we won't use the ocean resources to support the needs of humanity. And I think the oceans do have a role to play in supporting um, food security, for example. <laughs>
So we're going to sit here for a week. You're going to hear a whole lot of different talks. Some will be about Grand Challenge 1, 2, 3 or so on. Um, what would success look like? And would we, be, would we be able to, by the end of the week, define success for a challenge like this? And so it wants to have system level understanding of ecosystems. And I think we're going to see plenty of presentations that will show us that our system level understanding is improving. Um, we will see plenty of examples of where we now understand variability and its impacts on the ocean. But would that be success? That would be just, let's publish a few more papers, make the pile of scientific knowledge higher. Um, I think success has got to look something like it will provide information that will underpin sustainable, um, sustainable conservation and use of the ocean. Now that is happening in places, and you'll hear some talks again this week that will use the language around bright spots, places where we are seeing successful ocean, ocean management. But is that going to be enough? And how could we do that better at scale? And I hope that you'll leave this week really thinking about for understanding the ocean, helping society adapt and cope with the change that's pretty much inevitable, that we will have a really good job and we will end up being successful at the end of our, our careers. And answering Grand Challenge 1 will definitely be a part of measuring the, that success. So I'll leave with three points. In order to cope with a fast-changing world, you've got to be fast, you've got to be collaborative, and you've got to be opportunistic. Thank you very much. Any questions for Alistair? We have time for a couple of questions. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, you referred several times to, to the communication to the stakeholders. And you have now here a figure which shows uncertainties in the, in the development of the temperature. And I, I believe that once you put the uncertainties to the complexity of the, of the models, what you have in the right co corner, so it easily gets quite uncertain. How do you see that the uncertainty should be communicated? That is it good for science and is it good for policy? How, how we should do it? Um, you're dead right in that some of the information that we have to convey is very complicated. If we take the traditional science model of making an answer and then throwing it over the fence and hoping someone will be able to, ex to understand it or we will give them a very complex ex explanation at the end of the study, I think we're missing the point. If we bring in stakeholders much earlier into the development of research questions, in that, you know, that language is called you know, transdisciplinary research, for example, you bring stakeholders with you, then they will know what bits of that information are most useful to them. And stakeholders get better at picking the information that they can best use. But I've, I've found that the way to do it is involve them early and have lots and lots of conversations with them. And that's, it's a very expensive thing to do in terms of time. You write less papers when you have conversations with stakeholders. You are less productive as a traditional researcher when you attend their kinds of meetings and make that effort to do the communication. But I don't think we'll look at ourselves in another 10 years and think, gee, I'm glad I wrote another paper versus I think I'm glad I had impact with my science. Yeah, Alistair, thank you for a really stimulating talk to kick us off. It's inspiring. But, I, but you've been talking to us mostly as individuals, individual scientists. We work in organizations. Are the messages the same for the organizations or are they different? I think we can take our organizations with us. And at least in, in Australia, organizations are starting to value impact. And impact is now being defined much more broadly than just your scientific output. And so things like engagement with stakeholders, evidence of policy uptake of your research are becoming the things that, you know, give the institution credit as well. So I think that we can further emphasise to institutions the value of that, but the incentive system is also aligning, at least in my country, of reinforcing why that engagement matters. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Thanks for that interesting talk, Alistair. Um, you've been advocating for some time about the need for interventions in our marine systems, and so I think this is a nice forum to perhaps ask you about um, 
you know, how, how far do you think we can go? And perhaps to the social scientists, at what stage do we have to start worrying about ethics and, and start running into whole new dimensions of questions we haven't had before? I mean, in Australia, we, we're quite bold, I guess, in some of the initiatives being talked about, and most people would be happy with enhancing nutrients, for example, or replanting corals, but don't like the idea of transforming the ocean into a food-growing sort of aquaculture system. Mm -hmm. So wh what are your thoughts in terms of how far we should go with those interventions and what kind of science are we going to need to support that um, uptake? Thanks, Eva. I think a, lot, a focus of a lot of the science community has been on reducing emissions and they see anything else like getting ready to do interventions as an admission of giving up. And you're going to do, do your intervention because you've given up on restricting climate change. But I think unless we practice those kind of things, it'll be too late. So I think intervention is an insurance policy. And I think practicing those interventions is really important. And you're right, the appetite for doing different interventions varies. But if you gave me a choice, Eva, between would you like a coral reef or do you want nothing, I think I'd take a genetically modified coral reef. Um, if, for example, a fish species that is really important for a community can no longer complete its life cycle, maybe growing those up on land and then doing stock, in, stock enhancement by releasing those into the environment will be an acceptable thing for society. Um, I don't know about wide-scale climate manipulation because of the unanticipated consequences, but I think there are going to be points of intervention that society will be quite comfortable with once it's given the choice of, if you don't do this, you will have nothing. And we're facing a few of those, as you know. <laughs> 